Chag Sameach Sukkot. Happy Feast of Tabernacles to everyone listening. Today I'd like to talk about the fallen tabernacle of David. So to begin, we go to Leviticus chapter 23, which is the chapter which reveals God's calendar for the entire year. And we find in verse 33, where it begins to talk about the Feast of Sukkot, or the Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of Booths. And it says, Adonai spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Bnei Israel, to the children of Israel, and say, On the fifteenth day of this seventh month, so that's the fifteenth of Tishrei, is the Feast of Sukkot, that is the Feast of Tabernacles, for seven days to Adonai, an entire week-long celebration. On the first day, there is to be a holy convocation. That phrase, holy, uh, holy convocation or a sacred assembly, these are key indicators that this is to be treated just like a Sabbath day. It's a day of rest. And then it, it kind of clarifies and kind of confirms what I just said. You are to do no laborious work. Basically, just the work that you need to survive. You know, cooking. No cleaning. You know, no, no making money. Just, just what you got to do, you know, to, to, to live. For seven days, you are to bring an offering by fire to Adonai. The eighth day will be a holy convocation to you. So eight is a symbol of new beginnings. Um, after the week, you end that week with an extra day, and it's the eighth day. Um, it's, uh, it, it, it's treated just like a Sabbath, just like the first day of Sukkot. And a lot of times, uh, this last day, they kind of squeeze in a, 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 an extra holiday, which is Simchat Torah, uh, which is the celebration of the Torah, of the law. Why? Because we end the reading of the Torah cycle through the five books, and we roll the scroll back all the way to Genesis 1-1. Some people keep it on the eighth day. Some people keep it on the ninth day. Just depends on what sect uh, is and what the tradition is among that particular uh, Messianic and or Jewish sect. So it says the eighth day will be a holy convocation to you and you are to bring an offering by fire to Adonai. It is a solemn assembly. You should do no laborious work. These are the Moedim. These are the appointed times. These are the dates that I set on my calendar, says Adonai which you are to proclaim to be holy convocation. So every high holy day is just like a Sabbath. To present an offering by fire to Adonai, a burnt offering of grain offering, a sacrifice of drink offerings, each on its own day, besides those of the Shabbatot um, of Adonai and besides your gifts, all your vows and all your free will offerings, which you give to Adonai. So on the 15th day of the seventh month, we're still talking about Sukkot here, when you gather in the fruits of the land. So this is a harvest festival. This is actually what the pilgrims, when they came to the new world, they modeled Thanksgiving after Sukkot. And I think they had maybe three or four days that they celebrated that. And then in the modern day, of course, it just got whittled down to one day. But this is the origins the North American origins of Thanksgiving. So it says, besides those uh, of the, no, sorry, verse 39. So on the 15th day of the seventh month, when you have gathered in the fruits of the land, you are to keep the feast of Adonai for seven days. Now, it is believed that the very first day of Sukkot was the day that Messiah Yeshua was born because the manger scene was like a sukkah, was like a booth. They could not stay in the inn, so they stayed in a sukkah. Uh, you see nativity scenes, they look just like a sukkah, a three-sided structure with, uh, uh, you know, kind of a thatched or leafy uh, roof. And um, so they believe the first day is Yeshua's birthday, Jesus's birthday, because what happens on the eighth day what would be the eighth day celebration or Simchat Torah, they have them circumcised and they have them named. And we read all about that in the Gospels. Uh, so this fulfills the prophecy that the word became flesh and dwelt. That word dwelt is actually the word tabernacle. The word became flesh and tabernacled among us. So as you are to keep the Feast of Adonai for seven days, the first day is to be a Sabbath rest, and the eighth day will also be a Sabbath rest. On the first day, you are to take choice fruits, of trees, branches of palms, boughs of leafy trees, and willows of the brook, and rejoice before Adonai your God for seven days. 
You are to celebrate it as a feast to Adonai for seven days in the year. It is a statute until Messiah comes. No. It is a statute until you go off into exile. No. It says it is a statute forever, throughout your generations, meaning till the end of time. You are to celebrate it in the seventh month. You are to live in Sukkot, tabernacles, booths, for seven days. <laughs> now, in cold climates such as myself in New Brunswick, Canada, or even in Ohio, where I was born, uh, the weather's not really conducive. So it's hard to live out there, so we spend as much time as possible out there, meaning we eat our meals, we pray, we study, and if you're brave enough and if the weather's not too, um, too uh, inhospitable, you actually sleep out in the sukkah. I mean, it's like building a fort and sleeping out in the fort you built. I mean, this is a dude's holiday. I mean, what guy wouldn't want to do that? I mean, it brings out the little kid in us, right? So it's talking about gathering in the harvest, fest, uh, the harvest fruits and rejoicing before the Lord with these very items. And it says you are to celebrate the festival for Adonai for seven days. It is a statute forever throughout your generations. You are to celebrate it in the seventh month. You are to live in Sukkot for seven days. All native born in Israel are to live in Sukkot. Why? So that your generations may know that I had B'nai Israel, the children of Israel, to dwell in booths, tabernacles, Sukkot. When I brought them out of the land of Egypt, I am Adonai, your God. So most of the holidays really brings us back to the exodus from Egypt. You know, the, the liberation of our slavery from Egypt, which, spiritually speaking, always comes back to Yeshua, who came to liberate us from the spiritual bondage of sin. Uh, so this is the Feast of Tabernacles in a nutshell. Now, a, suk a sukkah a booth, a tabernacle. Traditionally, it's a three-sided shelter made from ready available materials. This is symbolic of our temporal frail bodies. Because in Genesis 2, uh, 7, it says that uh, basically the Lord collected a bunch of dirt, molded it together like clay into the form of a human being. And he said, he breathed into man uh, the breath of life. He breathed into his nostrils, mouth to mouth. He breathed in his face. And man became a living soul. Now, a tabernacle could be demolished just by a strong storm because they're not built to last. They're built to be temporal and they're built to be frail to remind us of the frailty of our human existence and the temporalness of our bodies and our human existence on earth. Just like the tabernacle could be easily destroyed by a strong storm or a strong wind, our bodies could just as easily be demolished. Cancer ravaged by cancer god forbid a car accident you know just just a split second our life can change because our body is affected in some irreparable way now the frame in which the sukkah is built around is like our bones it, it, it's 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 in in what we cover that frame with is symbolic of our flesh now the tabernacle has three sides and it's open in the front and we have a body soul and spirit with an opening where god is supposed to be some people call this the god-shaped hole we spend our whole lives trying to fill this hole because we feel we need to have some sort of fulfillment or meaning in our life we fill it with drugs alcohol careers you know women whatever and nothing satisfies until we find god until we find yeshua and then we are fulfilled so uh the, again the tabernacle is a three-sided uh, structure with an open front, which some the three sides symbolizes the three parts of our being, body, soul, and spirit, and has that opening where, where God is supposed to enter in. A tabernacle is easily erected and disassembled and transported to represent our sojourns on this planet. Because if you remember, I just read in Leviticus 23, 42, and 43 that this is a memorial of the wilderness wanderings, that God made Israel live in tents or live in booths. We are nomads and wanderers on this world. We are strangers on this planet because this world, this, this materialistic uh, fallen world is not our eternal home. It's the new heavens and the new earths. Uh, this, this will not be our permanent home. Because it says in Revelation that, he, create, that uh, he creates a new heaven and a new earth, that it is refined by fire. Second uh, Peter, or I think it's Second Peter, it's one in the letters of Peter, where he says the, the elements will melt with a fervent heat. So the traditional sukkah has a leafy roof. 
it's usually made from you know branches of some sort palm branches um, and other branches and it enables you to see the stars at night and to be able to see the stars through the roof reminds us of our eternal home i'd like to go to uh, revelation chapter 21 verses 1 through 5 and talk about this new home then i saw a new heaven and a new earth the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more now sea is the primordial ancient symbol of chaos symbol of the fallenness of this world verse 2 i also saw a holy city the new jerusalem coming down out of heaven from god prepared as a bride adorned for her husband this kind of reminds us of a sukkah you know this city coming down from heaven I also heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling of God is among men. That happened in John 1 1 when the Word became flesh and dwelt among us when Yeshua was born, which is a celebration of his birth. But it also is when God comes from the new heaven to the new earth to dwell among men. Behold, the dwelling of God is among men, and he shall tabernacle among them, it says in the Tree of Life version. They shall be his people. And God himself shall be among them and be their God. Oh, and this is a beautiful verse. Should bring you comfort. And he shall wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death shall be no more. Nor shall there be mourning or crying or pain any longer. For the former things have passed away. And the one seated upon the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. New heaven, new earth. And those of us that are resurrected, new bodies, right? Then he said, write this, write for these are trustworthy. These words are trustworthy and true. Now, I want to also kind of go back in scripture a little bit to Acts chapter 15. This is where we're going to talk about the fallen tabernacle of David. Acts chapter 15, beginning with verse 12. It says, the whole group became silent and were listening to Barnabas and Paul. As they were describing in detail all the signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. After they finished speaking, Jacob answered. Jacob, that is James, because this is the Tree of Life version, they were reverting back to their Hebraic origins of their names. So James is really Jacob in Hebrew. So J Jacob, James, answered, Brothers, listen to me. Simon has described how God first showed his concern by taking from Gentiles a people for his name. The words of the prophets agree as it is written. After this, I will return and rebuild the fallen tabernacle of David. I will, re I will rebuild its ruins and I will restore it so that the rest of humanity may seek the Lord, namely all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says Adonai, who makes these things known from old. Therefore, I judge not to trouble those among the Gentiles who are turning to God, but to write to them to abstain from the contamination of idols see the rabbis have have basically summed up the holiness code in these four laws these four laws became the kickstart laws for the gentiles to, to follow that began that process of a clean break from their pagan past in order to set themselves up to fellowship with jewish brethren without making them unclean so they couldn't celebrate things or go to the temple but it also set them up so that they can learn the rest of the commandments of the Lord from one Sabbath to another, because it says, but write unto them to abstain from contamination of idols, from sexual immorality, from what is strangled and from blood. For Moses from ancient generations has had in every city those who proclaim him, since it is read in all the synagogues every Sabbath. Okay, so two things we learn from this passage. Number one, let me read verse 16 again. After this, I will return and rebuild the fallen tabernacle of David. I will rebuild its ruins and I will restore it. So number one, uh, what we learn is in three parts. A, just as David for a time had to wander and live in tents and in caves as a result of King Saul, his son Absalom, eventually he stopped running and, he reign, and, and his reign and kingdom and dynasty was finally solidified and solidified for all time b during the times of yeshua there was no king in israel due to the roman occupation everyone was um expecting yeshua to be the returning king 
to sit on the throne of David when he triumphantly rode into Jerusalem on that donkey prior to Passover, what we call the triumphal entry. C, Yeshua being a descendant of David and rightful heir to the throne, told the religious elders of Israel to tear down his tabernacle and he would build it up, right back up within three days. And to that we go to John chapter two, starting at verse 12. After this, Yeshua went down to uh, Capernaum with his mother, brothers and disciples and they stayed uh, there a few days the uh, jewish feast of passover was near so yeshua went up to jerusalem in the temple he found the merchant selling ox uh, sheep and doves also the money changers sitting there he made a whip of cords and drove them out of the temple both the sheep and the oxen he dumped out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables see they were selling in the court of the gentiles preventing gentiles from getting close to god because that was their designated place to worship, and they turned into a marketplace. Verse 16, to those selling doves, he said, get these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered what was written. Zeal for your house will consume me. This is from um, Psalm 69. Then the Judean leaders responded, what sign do you show us since you were doing these things? This is where he says, verse 19, destroy this temple. Yeshua answered them, and in three days I will raise it up. The Judean leaders then said to him, <laughs> 46 years this temple was being built, <laughs> and you will raise it up in three days? But he wasn't talking about, but he was talking about the temple of his body. So after he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he was talking about this. Then they believed the scriptures and the word Yeshua had spoken. So the fallen tabernacle of David is representatory of Yeshua's uh, crucifixion, his death, burial, and resurrection. When he died on that cross, it was the fallen tabernacle of David, but within three days, he erected, he rebuilt that temple with his, you know, in his new resurrected body. So that's the first thing we learn from this passage in Acts chapter 15. Uh, there's a fourth thing, D, Yeshua is coming again to this earth to claim his throne. He didn't, the first time he didn't come to claim his throne, the first time he came to liberate us, to set us free from sin, to take on our sufferings. But he's returning again, and when he does, he's going to return to reclaim that Davidic throne. In Revelation chapter 19, beginning with verse 11, and we're going to go into chapter 20 to verse 6, it says, Then I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and the one riding on, on it is called Faithful and True. And he judges and makes war in righteousness. His eyes are like a flame of fire. Now, verse 12 is reminiscent of Daniel, of the ancient of days that Daniel saw, because, you know, the, the descriptions are, are similar in some respects. His eyes are like a flame of fire and, is, and has many royal crowns on his head, which means he conquered every kingdom of the world. Because when you conquer a king, you wear his crown to show that you're now in charge. He has, his, he has a name written that no one else knows except himself. This is idiomatic language regarding the fringes of the garment, the zitzit, which is tied and coiled in a special way. Five knots representing the law, the five books of Moses, four coils representing the unpronounceable name of God, yud heh vav -Hey, that we've lost the pronunciation to, the exact pronunciation that is. And then it says, uh, he is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, again, symbolizing victory. And his name, by which he is called, is the Word of God. This reverts back to John 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. The Word was God, same was in the beginning with God. And then it says the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So this Word of God is none other than Messiah Yeshua. And the armies of heaven clothed in fine linen, representing righteousness, white and clean, were following him on white horses. So these are the ones who have all gone on before that are now in the army of the Lord returning for the battle of Armageddon so that the Lord can take his throne. From his mouth came a sharp sword, and with it he may strike down the nations. He shall rule them with an iron rod and tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of Elohei Zevaot, the God of armies or the God of hosts. On his robe and on his thigh, he had a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Again, kind of referring to the Zitzit. He was born a Jew. He died a Jew. He's returning a Jew. 
Then I saw a single angel standing in the sun, and with a loud voice he cried out to all the birds flying high in the sky, Come and gather for the great banquet of God, to eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of generals and the flesh of mighty men. The flesh of mighty men is kind of maybe hinting about the return of the Nephilim. Because as in the days of Noah, so it will be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. What happened in the days of Noah? Genesis 6, the Nephilim, the human angelic hybrids that created these giants, these men of renown. And there's going to be a return of that. And some say that the UFO phenomena where women are abducted, impregnated, shown their offspring, is a fulfillment of that. Uh, the flesh of horses and those riding on them, the flesh of all men, both free and slave, both small and great. Verse 19, I saw, also I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war with the one who sat on the horse against his army. Then the beast was captured along with the false prophet who had performed the signs before him by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast as well as those who had worshipped his image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. The rest were killed with the sword, coming out of the mouth of the one riding on the horse. All the birds gorged themselves with their flesh. Now on to verse uh, chapter 20. Then I saw an angel come down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the abyss and a great chain. He seized the dragon, the ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. He also threw him into the abyss and locked and sealed it over him so that he would not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were completed. After these things, he must be released for a short while. Then I saw thrones and people who sat upon them, those to whom authority to judge was given. And didn't he say to his disciples that he was going to, they were going to even judge angels. So this is the seat of the, uh, of, of, of the, uh, the ruling apostles. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded. In other words, martyred because of the testimony of Yeshua and because of the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or his image, nor had received the mark on their forehead or on their hand. And they came to life. In other words, they were resurrected, new bodies, right? New Sukkot, right? They reigned with Messiah for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were completed. The first, this is the first resurrection. How fortunate and holy is the one who has a share in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death, meaning eternal death, eternal damnation and hell, has no authority. But they shall be Kohanim, priests of God and Messiah, and they shall reign with him for a thousand years. So that's the first thing that we get. Uh, uh, four points of the first thing we get from Acts chapter 15 regarding this fallen tabernacle of David. Now, the second thing we get from the tabernacle of David is that Sukkot is for everyone uh, now and in the time to come. So verse uh, chapter 15 verses 19 through 21, let me remind you, therefore judge not to trouble those among the Gentiles who are returning to God. Then we, verse 20 talks about the four starter laws, no idols, no sexual immorality, no blood, no strangulation. And then it says, for Moses and the ancient, uh, uh, from Mo for Moses from ancient generations has had in every city those who proclaim him, meaning established synagogues. Since he is read, Moses has read the five books of Moses. There's an annual reading cycle. Back in Yeshua's day, it was a triennial reading cycle of the Torah. Is read in all synagogues every Sabbath, implying that when these Gentiles convert, they keep the four starter laws, and that's enough for fellowship. Then every Sabbath, they come and learn the Torah through a year, three years, and then they learn how to keep the commandments that apply to them. So uh, that's the first point of the second thing that I want to say. B. Leviticus 23, it says these are the feasts of the Lord, not the feast of the Jews or the feast of the Israelites or the feast of the Hebrews. Over and over in the Torah, it says there's one law for the Israelite and for the stranger that sojourns among them, the mixed multitude that went out with him. And C of the second thing that I want to bring out is a prophecy in Zechariah chapter 14, which makes totally plain that Sukkot is for everyone, especially. Uh, during the millennial reign. So in Zechariah chapter 14, beginning with verse 16, 
Then all the survivors from all the nations that attacked Jerusalem will go up from year to year to worship the king, Adonai Zevaoth, the Lord of hosts, the Lord of armies, to celebrate Sukkot. So this is talking about Gentiles celebrating Sukkot. Furthermore, if any of the nations, now remember this is during the millennial reign. Furthermore, if any of the nations on the earth do not go up to Jerusalem to worship the king, Adonai Zevaoth, the Lord of hosts, the Lord of armies, they will have no reign. Why? Because this is a harvest festival. And you're thanking God for the harvest, and if you're not grateful, you don't get rain, so you don't get a next harvest. Verse 18, if the Egyptians do not go up and celebrate, because in another prophecy he says, I'm going to call the Egyptians mine one day, my people. If the Egyptians do not go up and celebrate, they will have no rain. Instead, they will, they, they will be plague, be the plague that Adonai will inflict on the nations that do not go up to celebrate Sukkot. This will be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all nations that do not go up to celebrate Sukkot. And that day, holy to Adonai, will be inscribed on the bells of the horses and the pots in Adonai's house, will be like the sacred bowls in front of the altar. In fact, every pot in Jerusalem and in, in Judah will be holy to Adonai Zebaot, so that everyone who comes to sacrifice will take them, cook in them. And that day there will no longer be a Canaanite in the house of Adonai Zebaot. Now, back to Acts 15, verses 16 and 17, and we'll wrap this up. Well, let's start with the verse 15. The words of the prophets agree, as it is written, After this I will return and rebuild the fallen tabernacle of David. I will rebuild its ruins, and I will restore it, so that the rest of humanity may seek the Lord. This is all coming together now with the passages in Revelation and Zechariah. Namely, the Gentiles who are called by my name, says Adonai who makes these things known from old. Defeat, captivity, exile are all temporal situations, yet even now the tabernacle of David is being restored. People are coming back to the Davidic King Yeshua and submitting themselves to his kingdom laws, to his Torah, which he said in Matthew uh, in the book of Matthew, he said, look, don't even think that I've come to destroy or abolish the law, the Torah and the prophets, the Old Testament, basically. He said, I didn't come to, to, to abolish them. I come to fulfill them. That Greek word means to fulfill, to bring them into their full and complete meaning and understanding for the purpose of doing them. And Yeshua was the, was the template, the, blue, the blueprint, the example. He showed us how to live the commandments out correctly in a pleasing way to God so that we won't be hypocritical and legalistic. Because God has a kingdom, and to have a kingdom, you have to have kingdom law. And there is a revival of believers, Jew and Gentile, coming back to Yeshua and realizing the, the advantages, the blessings that are in the Torah. That the Torah is not a curse, it's a blessing. Obeying it brings blessing, disobeying it brings death and curses. Obeying it brings abundant life. Uh, it's, it's the kingdom law. It's our, it's our instruction manual, how to live physically, mentally, and spiritually to our optimum, to our best. And after all, what is Yeshua called? He's called the living word. He's the living manifestation of the written word. And the written word up until to the time Yeshua was born was nothing but the Old Testament. The New Testament wasn't written yet. And the New Testament is even a misnomer. The New Testament is the Brit Chadasha, meaning the renewed covenant. What is it renewing? What covenant is renewing? All the covenants that were established in the Tanakh, the Old Testament, the law, the, law, the writing, and the prophets. It's renewing that. Yeshua is saying, I am not only the fulfillment of that, I bring, in, I bring all those covenants into fulfillment, into completion, into their full and complete meaning. And we read over and over about Sukkot and about the laws, he says, they're, they're for every generation. One law for, one, for, for every people, Jew and Gentile, Jew and sojourner. You know, Hebrew or Israelite and sojourner, stranger living among them, mixed multitude. It's for everybody to all generations, no matter where you live. Now, of course, like we've said before, there's some laws that are only pertain and only can be kept in the land of Israel under certain conditions. The temple being built, being one of them. Others are only for kings. Some are for men. Some are for women. You know, some are for Levitical priests. But all the ones that apply to us, all the 613 commandments and taking just those that apply to us has been summarized in 10. If you're keeping the 10, you're most likely keeping the 613. And if you're keeping the 10, there, it's even been boiled down even more simplistically to one because it gives us the motive of why we keep the commandments. 
And that's to love the Lord our God with all our whole heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love our neighbor as ourself. The one sums up the ten. The ten sum up the 613. And what's the motivation? Love. It, we Protestant Christians, we, we Gentile believers, have been raised and taught that the law is a curse, that uh, you know the, the, the law has been done away with, and that the law is too cumbersome and burdensome to bear. And Yeshua said, no, I didn't come to abolish it. I came to bring it into its full and complete meaning. It's, it, you know, Yeshua is the king, therefore he has kingdom law. The Jews never looked at the law of Moses as a burden. Why would God deliver them from the bondage of Egypt just to put them in bondage of the law? It makes no sense. That would be a cruel and sadistic God. The Jews look at the law just like we Westerners look at marriage vows. They're sacred. Why do we keep marriage vows? Because we love our spouse. We keep them out of love. We are faithful because out of love. Therefore, the Jews say we are faithful to God out of love. We will keep our wedding vows to God. They looked at the law being given at Mount Sinai as a wedding ceremony. And, the, and, and God said, will you? Here's my stipulations. And all Israel and the mixed multitude, for that matter, says we do. And so we keep them out. Of, love is the motivation. If you're keeping it for no other reason, to get brownie points, to look good, for self-recognition, it's vanity. doesn't count. You keep them out of love. And when you keep the commandments out of love, that keeps you from religiosity. It keeps you from legalism. It keeps you from Pharisaism. So remember, Sukkot. Sukkot is a harvest festival. Sukkot is like one big camp out for a whole week. Sukkot is the true uh, celebration of the birth of Messiah Yeshua. So Sukkot is, is, is wonderful, and if you can't build a sukkah, uh, if you have a tent, just pop your tent up in your yard and, uh, you know, bring a little heater out there. It gets awful chilly if you, you're brave enough to sleep out there. If not, just spend the day out there reading the Word of God. Spend the day out there praying. If you, if you, you, if you have a little trailer or a little camper on your property, use that as your temporary sukkah for this week. Uh, guys, thanks so much for listening. Go out there and have a great day. Shalom and God bless.